So welcome to the second lecture of our surgical lecture series. My name is Suha Farhad. I'm a final year medical student at AUB, and I'm part of the founding team at, uh, of the Women in Surgery Interest Group Lebanon Chapter and the Association of Women Surgeons at AUB. And I hold the position of the social media coordinator on that team. Before I introduce our speaker for today, let me just remind you of a couple of instructions so that the session runs as smoothly as possible. First, please make sure your microphone cameras are turned off for the entire length of the session. Second, please write all the questions you have in mind in the chat box, and our speaker will be ready to answer them all at the end of the session. And third, and most importantly, enjoy. So now we're ready to begin. I will start by introducing our speaker. Uh, our speaker for today is Dr. Rebecca Andrawos, a fourth year general surgery resident at the American University of Beirut Surgery Center. She received her medical degree from the American University of Beirut in 2016. Her specialty of choice is neck surgery and critical care. She currently holds the vice president position at the resident staff organization at AUBMC. And today she's going to talk to us about the perioperative management that is crucial for all aspiring surgeons to know. Dr. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this initiative, and I'm happy to present uh, uh, the perioperative management topic today. Uh, when, um, when I was first uh, asked to present this topic, uh, I remembered when I was an intern, uh, perioperative care is the easy topic. You know, it's the first module of any teaching session through the year. It's the first chapter of any reference book. It's the intern job, basically, so it has to be simple. And then with experience, um, you notice that it is actually the essence of surgery. And you get to understand that surgery is not only the operating room. Uh, so usually uh, we are all excited. We think of surgery, uh, what we do in the OR, what we do after this, the patient is under anesthesia and after the patient is under these sterile drapes and we can't even see uh, the person we are treating. Uh, but that's really the smallest part of what a surgeon does. Uh, you know, back in the days, they used to call the operating room the operating theater. So think about it as a theater and think about the procedure you are doing as a performance. It is very important and it is the highlight of what we do. However, the preparation before that and the repercussions after that are really the bulk and the things that take most time and the things that affect our patient the most, just like a concert or a performance. You prepare for months before that, and then how you do after this preparation will have the effect on you after that. Um, but the performance itself is just half an hour, maybe a couple of hours. So it's the same thing for surgery. Your patient comes in for this performance, but before this, you have a long journey of preparation. And after this, you have a long journey of follow-up. So this is how we need to look at things. And this is the aspects that we really need to think about as a surgeon. The patient is here to have a journey with you. So you guys are partners in something. You need to really get to know your patient well. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, perioperative management is really a very wide topic. While we think it's simple, we think it's straightforward, it's only a checklist that we need to proceed with. However, if we really want to go into the details, know everything about it, we can give sessions up to a week, maybe more. What I try to do is go through the basic concepts and the things you need to know uh, uh, as a start for you to later on uh, elaborate on the details because we don't have time for that. So I'm going to go over the perioperative phases, the risk, basic risk, risk assessment for any patient who is presenting for any surgery in general. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go, for example, into a person who's coming for a cardiothoracic uh, surgery in particular, or a neurosurgery case in particular, because each has its own uh, detail. Uh, but we're going to talk about the basic and general concepts. We're going to talk briefly about intra-op, because as I mentioned before, uh, intra-op is really the smallest part of our journey with the patient. And then we're going to talk about post-op with a small take home message. So the perioperative phases are obviously pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. Pre-op is the really bulk of our work, so we need to know all the details about the R patient. Why? Because if someone is presenting, for example, for a hernia repair, we know everything about hernia repair, but it differs if the patient has a cardiac disease or has an uncontrolled diabetes, 
or is really obese. So we really need to get to know our patient in order to be able to prepare for our procedure properly. A lot of patients will need a pre-operative care, maybe more important and longer than the operation itself. So we are surgeons, it's true, but a big part of being a surgeon is knowing all the medicine that we had learned in the 10 years that we've been training for. So it is important to understand the, the problem, the medical problem that the patient has, the medications he's on, the previous surgical history, et cetera. Uh, intraoperatively, obviously, we need to know about the procedure. We need to know about the complications that uh, can face us during the procedure, because if we cannot deal with the complication of the procedure, we shouldn't be um, performing it in the first place. And post-op, the follow-up is most important. It's true that we had done our job, with the procedure. However, how the patient does post-op, the complications he might face, if the results that we were hoping for uh, are attained or not, this is a very important step of our care for the patient. We are not a technician uh, just to do the procedure and leave. We are a doctor and we are taking care of a patient. So this is a very important concept that a surgeon should be aware of. Preoperatively, I cannot stress the importance of the informed consent process. So we usually hear, please make the patient sign consent. It's not a consent, it's an informed consent process. And these three words are very important for a lot of reasons. Informed, we need to explain to the patient the details of the procedure. What are the indications for it? What are the risks he is taking? What are the benefits he will get from this procedure? And what are his alternatives? Because although medically we have a lot of guidelines and we should do this and we should do that and they're correct. However, the decision is not ours. We need to tell the patient what's medically correct or what's medically advisable and then it's his decision uh, to take. And sometimes medically we have more than an option that we can, that we can uh, pick. So it's not always one plus one equals two and it's one, not always one answer. That's why it's a discussion and it's a process between us and the patient. So first, informed. Second, consent. Obviously, you need to consent for it. As I said, it's his decision. So sometimes the patient take decisions that are, are medically faulty in our perspective. However, it is their health. We, as much as we can, explain all the details, but it's their decision. And it's a process because it's not a one-time thing. So it's not that the patient is in my clinic, I explain all I'm going to do, and that's it. So patient is in clinic. We decided on surgery, we explain all the details, we go through the informed consent, and then the patient comes in to the, to the operation, he needs a pre-op evaluation, we go through the details again, and then before the surgery, it's always advisable to go see your patient in the recovery room, make sure he doesn't have any further questions, make sure he doesn't have any concerns, and then even at that time, the patient has the right to revert his consent and tell you, you know what, I don't want to do the surgery anymore. So it is a process and it is the most important process you can go through before the operation because if you inform your patient about all the risks, then if God forbid he has any complication and he is well prepared and expecting that this is a possibility, trust me, he will be more compliant with the, with the care and he will be more compliant with the follow-up. So um, usually the informed consent process is more explained or uh, they go into details in research. So I have this, this diagram here that shows steps in research. However, you can easily apply it to medical uh, practice. So the patient needs to voluntarily be uh, willing to go to the procedure. He needs to understand the, per the purpose, the duration of the procedure, all the details about it. He needs to see the risk and discomforts and needs to understand the benefits and needs to know the alternatives for him to take an informed decision. So the patient is okay to go with surgery. However, before we indulge in this decision, we have to make sure that the benefits of the surgery outweigh the risks. And in order for us to do this, we have to make sure what are the risks of our patient. The risk is not only the risk of the procedure, as you mentioned before, the risk is the risk of uh, all the comorbidities of that patient in particular. So we have a lot of tools to assess the pre-op risk. First of all, the major tool of all medicine is history and physical exam. So you need to understand all the tiny bits of detail of the past medical history, past surgical history, family history, medications, and a history of present illness of your patient. This is the first thing we learn in medical school and the most important thing that we stay with you until uh, 
you are a very experienced attending physician in any hospital or any clinic. Physical exam is your other uh, tool of, uh, of interest. Look for your patient from top to bottom. You might be operating for, for a, a inguinal hernia, for example, very simple procedure that you do every day. However, you might notice that your patient has, for example, a jugular vein distension, and this will affect your type of anesthesia. This will affect if it's an elective surgery, you might need to postpone it, etc. So we did our history and physical exam. Let us start with the risk assessment preoperatively. The first tool we have is the American Society of Anesthesiologists Physical Classification. This is a classification that is extremely discussed in a lot of uh, guidelines in the American College of Surgeons uh, and definitely in, the, in the societies for anesthesia. So this is a classification that will tell you how sick your patient is. Okay, so you clinically assessed it, but we, you need to put a number on it just to uh, have a proper uh, association to what are the risks and benefits and what are the steps you need to take. So this is a, a, a ASA score from one to six. One is a normal healthy patient. So this is a patient who do not have any risk, no past medical history, no past surgical history, nothing of significant that will affect your uh, risk uh, process. Uh, class two is a patient with mild systemic disease. You know, the regular patient with a controlled diabetes, controlled hypertension, maybe smokes a little, uh, maybe has a borderline obesity, et cetera. Three is a patient with a severe systemic disease. So this is a patient with a disease that is not controlled, a disease that's affect affecting his functional status daily and putting some limitations. Here, we need to think about a pre-op optimization. We need to understand that the pre-op assessment is not just a checklist we fill. This is important to take important decisions in terms of the type of anesthesia, the type of procedure, the type of approach, the timing of the procedure, and obviously possible optimization before our intervention. Class four is a patient with a systemic disease that is threatening the life of the patient immediately. So a recent MI, uh, a recent stunting, an ongoing cardiac ischemia, maybe an end-stage renal disease, uh, undergoing regular dialysis, uh, um, heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, etc. Uh, stage five is a patient who will have a direct threat to his uh, life if we don't operate. So an obvious example would be a ruptured aneurysm, maybe a massive trauma, intracranial bleed affecting the level of consciousness, a patient who cannot protect their airway, massive bleeding that is not controlled, etc. And score six is a patient who is diagnosed brain dead. Okay, so obviously, whenever you want to intervene on a patient who's brain dead, you will think twice, uh, maybe uh, talk to, about the family, what's their uh, expectations, what's their plan of care, etc. Another tool we have for risk assessment is the uh, ACS Nesquip Surgical Risk Calculator. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, tool because you jog in uh, the details of your patient. Uh, if they have congestive heart failure, if they, if they have dyspnea, COPD, what's the BMI, what's the age, what's the procedure you're doing. So this is a tool uh, that uh, that tells you not only the risk of the patient alone, but the combination of the risk of the procedure and your patient. It's a very nice calculator that you can find on MedCalc. I advise you to use it whenever you have a patient who's undergoing surgery because this tool will give you a list of percentages of the risks of possible post-op complications. So it will tell you about any complication, risk of urinary tract infection post-op, pneumonia post-op, readmission, renal failure, death, and other details depending on the procedure you are uh, you are jogging in uh, the the calculator. Okay, so uh, this is important because when you want to discuss with your patient the risks. You need to know the numbers. You need to tell them you have that amount uh, of risk where you will have a leak after, for example, a bowel resection and stomosis. You will have this amount of risk on cardiac complication post-op. You'll have this amount of risk of maybe death. So this is when the patient will actually have the luxury of having an informed consent. Otherwise, he wouldn't really be informed. So uh, these are tools that we can use for assessment in general. However, I'm a critical care fan, and in ICU, we always go system by system for us not to miss any details. So I'm going to go system by system 
to talk about risk assessment that we can use and post up uh, care that we need to pay attention to uh, in order not to miss anything. Of course, you don't have to go system by system whenever your patient is here. You might have another way of, of following things up, but make sure you don't miss anything because everything counts in your risk and everything counts in your decision. Obviously, if you're in a tertiary care center, you can just consult a cardiologist or consult a pulmonologist. Uh, however, they're not going to take the decision for you. That's why you as a surgeon need to understand the details and the risks and how to evaluate these systems, even if it's not your specialty, because it is your risk and it is your patient that you will be eventually taking decision, a joint decision, obviously, with your patient. And keep in mind, you might not be working in a tertiary care center with all the facilities of uh, specialists that are available and, and um uh, diagnostic uh, tests and tools that are really specialized to give you an answer. So you need to have an idea how to work around these details. Let's start with our cardiovascular. So uh, our concern uh, of the cardiovascular status of the patient is definitely the quest uh, to, uh, to answer the question, is my patient uh, going to uh, uh, sustain the general anesthesia or the, the the stress that my operation will put on his heart. So uh, to start the assessment, first of all, we need to categorize if the patient uh, need, needs an emergent surgery or an elective surgery. If we need an emergent surgery, then there's nothing we can do except go to the operating room. However, if we're suspecting that our patient cardiac-wise is compromised, we need to have special monitors uh, during the operation. So uh, if it's an emergent surgery, we need intra-op to have maybe a cardiologist, maybe a TEE monitoring, uh, uh, maybe a swan gans to have proper output on the cardiac output, on the SVR, on the uh, wedge pressure, etc. So this is the only thing we can do when the patient is coming for emergency and we are suspecting that he is compromised or risky is to have proper intra-op monitoring and definitely proper post-op follow-up. However, if it's an elective surgery, we need to assess properly the risk. If the patient has uh, symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, then definitely we need to treat the acute coronary syndrome and postpone our procedure. If the patient does not have acute coronary syndrome, we need to assess his risk. So the risk of a major cardiac event is assessed through a revised cardiac risk index. Uh, it's another calculator that obviously jogs in the details of the patient and will give you the cardiac risk uh, of the procedure, the post-op. MI, post op cardiac failure, etc. So, another really interesting tool and calculator that is very important to use uh, to assess our patient. So, if the risk is low, then we can proceed with the surgery. If the risk is high, then we need to assess the functional status and capacity of the patient. Another tool to do this is uh, the metabolic equivalent, what we call METS. So, you hear the cardiologist talk about METS. They say the patient, the patient mass is more than four, so we can proceed. So the cutoff is four to consider that the patient has a poor functional capacity. Again, numbers are there just to help us and to put guidelines and to have uh, something that we can, uh, a language that we can share with each other as doctors. But keep in mind, the numbers have to be really uh, linked to your assessment, to your patient. So maybe the number is four, maybe the number is seven, but you really need to project the status of your patient. That's why I go back to history and physical exam. So the METS is a um, bunch of questions about the functionality of the patient. Can he go uh, a couple of flights of stairs without stopping? Does he do the personal activity at home alone? Or can he go on a treadmill on a certain rate, etc.? So another tool that we can also use uh, to calculate uh, and if it is more than four, then the patient has a good functional capacity, we proceed to surgery. If it is less than four, then here we need to consider serious invasive testing. We need to consider echo, we need to consider a stress test. And sometimes our patient might need an angio and stenting uh, before we go to the surgery. So this is when the risks of a cardiac event all outweigh the benefits of an elective surgery, and then we have to postpone. Um, I'll go uh, briefly about uh, METS and about the uh, risky patients uh, as it is um, described by the American College of Cardiology and the American Society of Heart Association. So uh, these are the predictors of a risky patient. So major risks are whenever they have unstable coronary syndrome, 
acute MI, decomp decompensated heart failure, uh, high-grade AV block, maybe symptomatic arrhythmias, etc. Intermediate is whenever they have mild angina, previous MI, uh, compensated heart failure, diabetes who are insulin dependent, and renal insufficiency. And again, the minors are advanced age, abnormal EKG, uh, rhythm, uh, uh, other than sinus, maybe AFib, maybe uh, some sort of any arrhythmia, no functional capacity, a history of strokes, and uncontrolled systemic hypertension. Uh, when it comes to the EKG, uh, usually we get a pre-op EKG for any person who has a cardiac, uh, a cardiac uh, vast medical history. Otherwise, anyone who is above 40, of age for males and 45 for females, you get them as routine checkups. So if you have any findings on that, then you have to consider the patient as minor risk. So uh, table two will show you uh, some of the METS questions. So whenever the patient is uh, four and above, so whenever the patient can climb a flight of stairs, walk on a level ground uh, for 6.5 kilometers per hour, run a short distance, do a heavy work, uh, do some uh, activities without really being exhausted, this is when we can say he has a adequate or acceptable functional capacity and METS above four, and then we can proceed with any intervention. Uh, this stratifies our procedures. So when we are classify our patient, whether he has a high cardiac risk or low cardiac risk, we have to complement this with the risk of the procedure. So are we uh, performing a high risk procedure, a low risk procedure, etc. So a high-risk procedure would be an emergent operation. So as we mentioned, anything that is emergent, urgent, we cannot optimize the patient for it and he has risks, then this is considered high risk, uh, particularly in elderly. Uh, aortic or major vascular surgery, peripheral vascular surgery, uh, vascular and, and cardiothoracic surgeries are very demanding in terms of what the, uh, the, pathophysi the physiology of the patients needs to provide for them to heal and sustain the stress of the operation, and anticipated prolonged procedures with a large fluid shift and blood loss. Intermediate would be a carotid endarterectomy, head and neck surgery, intraperitoneal, intrathoracic, orthopedic, and prostate. And low would be any endoscopic procedure, superficial procedure, cataract, breast, any subcutaneous fast procedure that we are uh, proceeding, that we are performing on our patient. So, this is the assessment of our cardiac risk, very basic, of course. Uh, and then obviously post-op, we need to evaluate how our patient is responding and how they are reacting to all the stress that they went through. So it's not just that we look at these before the operation and then after the operation, just forget that we have a cardiovascular system. It's very important to keep in mind that post-op chest pain, post-op MIs, post-op heart failures are very common, especially in people who are at risk. So we need to have a very low threshold for a patient who would tell us, I have a chest pain today, uh, or I have a discomfort at the epigastric area, or maybe I'm short of breath, or I have a chest tightness. So even though it might be just nothing, it might as well be something very serious. So be on the safe side and assess your patient and keep in mind that although you are worried about your procedure and maybe your first concern is a surgical site infection, if the operation went well, if you have the good results, However, your patient is not only the operation and not only the system you have operated on. There are other things that will react and have repercussions after a surgery. Second would be our pulmonary status. So again, if the patient has COPD, if he's a heavy smoker, uh, if he had a long surgery before and his lung capacity is at risk, this is all things that we need to account for, especially if we're going for general anesthesia. Don't forget you are intubating your patient. Intubation is not a benign process. So whenever you put your patient on full support, he might not be able to recover whenever you put him out of support with the risk of any procedure that you had uh, performed, especially in high-risk procedure and high-risk patients. So one of the tools to assess the pulmonary status uh, is uh, the ASCAT score, the one that I'm projecting. Again, another tool. Uh, that it's a calculator. You drag in uh, the age of the patient, the oxygen saturation, pre-op, other risk factors such as respiratory infections recently, anemia. Uh, keep in mind, anemia is your oxygen, the hemoglobin is your oxygen carrying capacity. So if, if you have low oxygen carrying capacity, your patient will have problems delivering oxygen to your uh, to his tissues. Uh, 
And although this is a systemic problem, it manifests as a pulmonary issue. So you need to, to keep this in mind. And any emergency surgery, obviously. Uh, what's the surgical incision and what's the duration? Uh, depending on the points that you gather from the score, you drop in the patient into a low risk, intermediate risk, or a high risk for post or pulmonary complication. This is when you will have to decide, maybe if I have the option of not doing intubation and general anesthesia, I will go for it. Maybe if I have to go for general anesthesia, I will consider uh, extubating my patient to a bypass, for example, or uh, getting him to a monitored unit the first 24 hours after surgery. So this is why these pre-op assessments are very important. And again, we assessed our patient pre-op, we need to keep an eye post-op. So post-op, whenever someone especially gets a general anesthesia, their lungs are deflated and they need to uh, uh, practice again inflating properly. So I call it the pulmonary gym post-op, that is the incentive. So the incentive spirometer is very important and it's a big step of your follow-up on the patient and the patient's uh, work after the surgery to prevent any further pulmonary complication. I'll move on to the nephrology system. This is where I discuss the fluid status and electrolyte uh, imbalances perioperatively. So for you to be able to assess well, you need to really know the basics about what's the normal plasma compositions and what are your fluid composition. So it, there's a big difference when you resuscitate your patient with a lactated ringer solution versus a normal saline solution. So these are things also that we, we need to take decision. So if your patient comes in preoperatively, you need to make sure he's not dehydrated because the OR is another risk of dehydration. So you need to make sure your patient is properly hydrated. He doesn't have an acute kidney injury before the, the OR. He doesn't have any electrolyte imbalances that would affect uh, his status in particular, uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, for example, in, in case of low potassium or high potassium or diminished calcium, etc. So um, these are the basics you need to know. What are the composition of your fluids and what is the plasma composition and what are your patient's uh, labs pre-op in order for you to decide if you need hydration before the operation or not. If a low-risk patient is coming with normal labs before the OR, you don't need to really flood them with fluids because keep in mind an overloaded patient will have increased complication post-op. Uh, fluid overload will affect your, uh, your lung status, will affect your cardiac stress, it will affect even your wound healing, uh, and it will affect your surgery. If you go into a patient that's edematous, it's way harder working with the tissues than with a patient who is uvolemic. So your volume status is very important, and understanding these details and knowing the composition of what you're giving your patient, what's coming out of your patient, is crucial for you as a surgeon to follow up. Uh, pre-op and post-op, and to understand uh, the repercussions of your surgery. A lot of bowel surgery, for example, when you have an ileostomy, the ileostomy is a very high output uh, piece of bowel. So um, you need to understand the outputs of your of uh, your patient. This is another crucial thing you need to keep in mind. So what does the duodenum secrete? What is my patient losing with an ileostomy? So the ileum has a has a lot of potassium, so I need to follow up on my patient's potassium. If it's a colostomy, for example, uh, the volume is less, so maybe I don't need to resuscitate my patient as much for them not to have uh, uh, volume overload and then uh, a lot of repercussions and complications. So this is another thing to really understand and keep in mind for your patient resuscitation. And then your patient is most of our intra-abdominal surgeries, we keep the patient nil per os after the surgery, which is NPO. We, we uh, cannot feed our patients for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, like um, bowel surgery, waiting for bowel activity to come back, etc. So our patient is not getting uh, the basic needs of electrolytes and fluids. So that's why we need to understand another uh, concept, which is maintenance versus deficit. So any one of us has a maintenance requirement of fluids, a maintenance requirement of electrolytes that we need to uh, provide our patient with whenever they're not eating because we usually get this from food and water that we drink. So you need to provide your patient maintenance and whatever he is losing, okay, so you look back whatever your patient, what are the secretions he's having, you need to replace the deficit. So if a patient comes in with a potassium of 2.8, for example, 
you need to correct the potassium back to normal, which is four, uh, 3.5 to 4, which is uh, what we usually, the numbers we like to see in surgery is 4 for proper bowel activity. And then on top of this correction, you need to give them their maintenance, which is 0 0.5 to 1 uh, mech per kilo. So again, this is very important. So your patient will not lag in terms of fluid and electrolytes, because again, these have a lot of complications pre-op and post-op. So you need to be familiar with the uh, normal numbers, normal ranges, you need to be familiar uh, with uh, all the formulas of free water deficit, the corrected uh, uh, calcium, the corrected uh, uh, calcium uh, according to albumin, the corrected sodium uh, according to your sugar status, and how would you proceed to keep your patient to volumic, give them the proper maintenance and correct any deficit. This is a day-to-day follow-up. We don't just take random CBC and CAM9 on the patient. These have basis. We take CAM9 to follow up on a deficiency that you are expecting your patient to lose. You take CBC to make sure that he's not bleeding post-op. So have a proper thought process on what the problem of your patient is in order to pick the right diagnostics and have enough tools for you to be able to uh, provide your patient with the best care possible. So again, just think we need to, to be familiar with not to miss things on our patient, like um, uh, the, uh, the the sorry symptoms of each uh, electrolyte deficiency, what we see on EKG, uh, what the patient can present with, so we don't miss it. Because uh, a lot of time, maybe the, the patient will tell us, well, I'm having muscle weakness. And we tell the patient, oh, okay, it's okay, you're tired, you had a big surgery. But maybe the weakness is from a high calcium, for example. So these are things we need to keep in mind. Infectious diseases. You all hear us saying we need to send antibiotics to the operating room. So what's the rationale behind this? Um, we have a wound classification, obviously, and every procedure has a risk of infection. So the classification goes as clean, clean, contaminated, contaminated, and dirty. Clean is any elective surgery in which you are not breaching the GI tract, there is no infection, there is no pus, like for example, breast surgery or polycyte insertion or a lipoma excision. These are clean surgeries, or maybe vascular surgeries. Okay? These surgeries have a very low risk of infection, less than 2%, and maybe this is even an inflated number. Clean contaminated is when you are breaching the, the uh, GI tract but it is controlled. So whenever you have an appendectomy without spillage, or cholecystectomy without spillage, no major infection or abscess in the abdomen, this is a clean contaminated the risk of the surgical site infection and intraoperative infections are less than 10%. Contaminated is when you breach your GI tract or when you have, uh, for example, um, a gross spillage from uh, an appendix or uh, a biliary tract, or you have a penetrating trauma, this, has a higher risk of infection. And obviously, directly whenever you have um, curlin discharge, abscess, uh, maybe stools, et cetera, this is the highest infection of all. So depending on what's your wound class, you uh, decide on what's the antibiotics that you need to use uh, pre-op and post-op and for how long you need to keep your antibiotics. The most important thing for surgical prophylaxis is to give your antibiotics 30 minutes for incision. If you give it uh, long before that, you will not be properly covered for skin incision. And if you give it after that, obviously you're not covered for skin incision. So which antibiotics to use? This is the recommendations. Uh, maybe in practice, sometimes we use uh, not exactly the same antibiotics, but keep in mind the coverage, okay? So uh, any cutaneous surgery or any clean surgery, we need skin coverage, which is usually staph aureus and staph epidermidis, which is usually covered by a first generation or second generation cephalosporin. In abdominal surgery, on the uh, other hand, uh, you have to cover gram positive, you have to cover enteric content, you have to cover uh, sometimes anaerobes uh, if you have an abscess, for example. So this will affect which antibiotics you pick. And this will affect if you need only a dose pre-op in clean surgeries, if you need uh, for 24 hours after surgery, if it's uh, clean contaminated, if you need to keep it uh, uh, for a week, if it's a dirty contaminated surgery. So whenever you have, whenever you're not using your antibiotic only as surgical prophylaxis, you will use it as treatment in terms of contamination and uh, dirty wounds. 
So then you will depend on what's the type of bacteria you have, if you have a proper source control, uh, etc. And keep in mind whenever you're operating that all antibiotics have a half-life. And this half-life, after four to five half-lives in time, your antibiotics will no longer be effective in, in your system. And hence, you need a redose. So in long surgeries, you have to keep in mind that um, what's the half-life of your antibiotics and when do you need to redose. Hematology, so DVT prophylaxis, anticoagulation, another concern we need to think about. So whenever your patient comes in, before you go to the operating room, you need to assess what's the thromboembolic risk of your patient versus the bleeding risk of your patient and the procedure that you're undergoing, uh, and decide on what type of anticoagulation, if needed, accordingly. So the Caprini score is a tool, it's another calculator, uh, where you drug in your patient details, the history of uh, uh, cancer, history of the recent thromboembolic events, uh, history of uh, hypercoagulable state, and then you will have the option on either low risk, where you only need early ambulation after your surgery, intermediate risk, on where you can only apply SCDs, uh, which, is, which stands for a compression device. Okay, this is like a machine, it can go below me or above me, and then it can uh, provide some compressions that will help the vascular flow, uh, or if you need proper anticoagulation. And whenever you need proper anticoagulation, you need to understand uh, your half-life and uh, mode of action of the different anticoagulations uh, for you to decide on when to stop it, when to give it. Uh, for example, if the patient has uh, an AKI, you cannot use low enough, you need to use heparin. So these are only things you need to be aware of. Now, if your patient is already on anticoagulation or antiplatelets for any uh, medical reason, you need to understand when to stop it. So usually if the patient is on unfractionated heparin, uh, it's uh, reasonable to stop it two to six hours uh, before the surgery. If he's on Lovinox, then 12 to 24 hours is acceptable. Uh, warfarin, we need five days. And keep in mind if it's a... a emergent procedure, you can always reverse your coagulopathy. So you reverse your heparin with protamine sulfate and you reverse your uh, warfarin with vitamin K and FFP, maybe PCC if it's available. Again, when you're reversing, you have to also think about the risk of thromboembolic events in your patient. Uh, other antiplatelets and anticoagulation like the NOAX, we need uh, 24 to 48 hours, and obviously the antiplatelets, we need five to seven days. So you need to plan your procedure accordingly. Um, sometimes uh, uh, nowadays the new, uh, the new recommendations that maybe you can operate on aspirin, depending again on the risk of the patient, risk of procedure, risk of bleed, if the patient is high risk for stopping the dual antiplatelets. Uh, so, again, talking about the perioperative uh, anticoagulation, patient with high risk of, uh, uh, with a procedure of high risk of bleed versus a procedure with low risk of bleed. So, as I mentioned before, this is something that we need to get into account. And uh, on, on, um, depending on this uh, criteria, you will uh, decide postoperatively when you can resume your anticoagulation. So, definitely, if the patient is at risk, we would like to resume anticoagulation as soon as possible. That's why it's very important in the operating room uh, to have a clear uh, assessment of whether you went out with the patient dry or you have a lot of oozing or you have an uncontrolled bleed, because this will jog into your decision on when to resume your anticoagulation. Uh, endocrinology, you have to make sure your patient's diabetes is controlled because high blood pressure, uh, sugar will affect your post-op healing, your post-op infection, your uh, your uh, uh, post-op uh, wound complication. So it's very important to make sure the uh, diabetes is under control. And uh, all studies have shown recently that you would like your patient's tax code to be less than 180. So it was before less than 150, and then they started seeing that the patients are having a lot of hypoglycemia. So, and then uh, the studies showed that 180 is the proper cutoff. Uh, another thing you need to assess for is the thyroid status. A lot of patients come in with an undiagnosed hypo or hypothyroidism. So if you have any hint of suspicion, you need to investigate this before your elective surgery. If the patient is already on treatment, then you need to make sure that they're well treated, not over or under, under treated to avoid any thyroid storm. 
and wound healing complication and recovery complication also. Uh, the thing that I'm going to go into details uh, uh, about an endocrinology is uh, steroid stress dose. So if your patient is on a steroids, uh, they're, they're considered a suppressed patient. So non-suppressed patient on steroids is if they're taking exogenous steroid for less than three weeks or prednisone, prednisone less than five, which is usually equivalent to the physiologic dose of, uh, of steroids in our body, uh, then with a low-risk procedure, you do not need to stress dose your patient with steroids. However, if they're taking prednisone milligram per day for three weeks or more, the recommendations are the following. With minor procedure, you just keep your patient on their normal dose. With moderate procedure, you remember we talked about the classification of procedure in the cardiovascular system. So if you're having a moderate risk procedure, you will give the patient a morning dose of IV 50 milligram hydrocortisone before the incision, and then 25 FPH for 24 hours after the surgery, and then they will go back to their maintenance dose. If it's a major procedure, you will need to give them 100 milligrams hydrocortisone before the induction, and then 50 every eight hours for 24 hours, and then you taper the dose by half every day until you reach the maintenance level again. And post-op, definitely, you, keep, you need to keep uh, an eye on adrenal insufficiency. So a lot of patients will develop uh, persistent and resistant post-op hypotension, uh, and we, it slips our mind that he is a suppressed patient and it might be an adrenal insufficiency. Uh, GI tract, our NPO status, and our, our nutritional status. So nutrition will affect also our post-op healing rate and wound complication, uh, and uh, maybe our decision on whether to do bowel anastomosis or go for a stoma. So we need to really assess the patient if he's well-nourished before or not. And the tools for this are first history, if he's not eating, if he's uh, losing weight, etc. And other things, we have numbers. So albumin uh, assesses the long-term nutritional status because the half-life is 18 to 20 days versus transferrin and pre-albumin, which will give us an idea of the nutritional status uh, at a shorter period because their half-lives are shorter. So we need to consider this in our labs in a patient who are suspecting, suspecting poor nutritional status on a patient who, on whom we expect a lot of needs post-op for recovery, okay? Obviously, if we, have, if we need to supplement our patient, enteral feeding is... Uh, definitely preferred over parenteral, but if we have no other option, the patient is not tolerating or maybe he has GI incontinuity or anything, we have to resort to parenteral nutrition. Uh, obesity, the other spectrum of, uh, of the nutritional status, is also a concern because a lot of times it will hinder our post op, our, our intra op options, and it will definitely have an effect on post op complications, especially wound complications, healing, etc. Now, NPO. So for how long we need to uh, keep our patient NPO, keep in mind NPO is a safety measure. So it is only to prevent aspiration whenever we're going for uh, anesthesia. So uh, it does not have to do with your procedure, uh, unless obviously you are operating on the bowels, then we talk about bowel prep and we talk about patient being not on solid fluids. So when we open the, the bowels, we will not have cross uh, intra up. But in general, it's a safety measure. Okay, so uh, you stop uh, uh, any uh, fatty and heavy and major solid foods eight hours pre-op. Uh, you can still have formula and milk up to six hours pre-op, breast milk up to four hours, and clear liquids up to two hours. Um, again, this is another tool to assess uh, nutritional status if patient suspected that he's uh, malnourished, and then uh, we chalk him into a risk and then decide accordingly whether he needs support or not. So these are things we need to look at in history in assessing the nutritional status. One, the BMI, if it's too low, and definitely if it's too high for obesity. Uh, two, if the patient is losing weight. Uh, and three, what's, what is he eating, if he's not eating at all? And again, the numbers we already talked about, the albumin transfer and pre-albumin, and then we decide on the intervention. Post-op, sometimes our patients, if they stay for a long a time uh, uh, NPO, then we need to supplement them. Uh, again, with the proper calorie and protein intake. So this is when we decide maybe if the patient is not tolerating, maybe put an MG tube or an MD tube for proper feeding enteral. And if it's if we cannot go for enteral feeding because of bowel inactivity or any other reason, then we consider enteral uh, feeding. And this is something that we really need to keep a close eye on because uh, parenteral feeding is through a central line, high risk of infections, high risk of liver injury, 
uh, high risk of the hyperglycemia. So again, this is something that we need to balance. It's not uh, an order that you put on the system and then forget about. The new emerging problem of pre-op assessment, COVID. Uh, so as Dr. Alami mentioned in the first uh, lecture, uh, take your pulse first. So protect yourself. Uh, it's all about your patient, of course, but if you don't take the proper precautions for you, you will not be able to be of assistance to your patient anymore. So nowadays with the pandemic of COVID, we are assessing the patient pre-op uh, for COVID-19. Uh, in order for us to take the proper precautions, first in terms of PPEs, second in terms of uh, pulmonary care. So if the patient uh, has some sort of changes in his lungs that we need to account for in intubation, extubation, etc. So this is something to keep in mind nowadays. Unfortunately, hopefully it will not be long, and I hope all of you are safe. Intraoperatively, uh, so now that we have our patient prepped, intraop we have to keep in mind a proper skin preparation. So we use chlorhexidine usually, betadine if the patient is uh, allergic or for some particular procedure like cardiac procedure nowadays, they still use sometimes uh, betadine. However, chlorhexidine is the skin prep of choice. Uh, second, if we have an area that we are working with and we have hair on it, we definitely need to clip it versus shaving. So shaving will have cracks in the skin, introduce infection. That's why we go for clipping. It only cuts the hair, it keeps the skin intact. Uh, to prevent uh, skin infections. And we need to keep uh, an eye on the hemodynamics of our patients. So it's true that we are operating, we need to keep uh, focus on the procedure and the anatomy and et cetera. However, if the patient is deteriorating, if we're having any hemodynamic issue, maybe we need to go for, um, uh, for a damage control surgery and stop and take the, the patient to the intensive care unit. Or maybe we need to adjust the pressure of a uh, laparoscopic procedure because uh, pneumoperitoneum affects the hemodynamics of the patient. So these are things as a surgeon that we need to keep the eye on, uh, not only worry about the procedure and the anatomy. And then post-op, obviously we need to keep an eye on everything system by system as we discussed before. Uh, we need to take care of the pain. We need to make sure the patient doesn't go into urinary retention. We need to make sure they don't bleed. So these are the main uh, immediate post-op uh, uh, complications that we might encounter. And you're all familiar with the teaching of the five W's. So whenever our patient develops a fever, post of day one, two, wind, we think about atelactasis and pneumonia. Post of day three to five, water, we think about UTI, if he has polycatheters and urinary uh, symptoms, etc. Four to five, walking, so DVTs. Uh, five to seven, wound, wound infections, surgical site infections, intra-abdominal conductions, maybe a leak if you have anastomosis and seven and plus when their drugs with drawing, et cetera. So this is a roadmap again to consider differentials. However, if my patient is febrile day one, could it be UTI? Well, it could be. Maybe he had uh, some bacteria in the urine and then he developed a UTI after the operation. So it's not set in stone. It's just a roadmap for assessment. However, we always need to keep our uh, spectrum wide and uh, consider anything. Again, I cannot stress follow up, follow up, follow up. So you uh, discharge your patient, but uh, you follow up with them. You're not only the technician who operated on them, you're their doctor. Last thing I'm going to talk about is enhanced recovery after surgery, ERAS. So this is also steps uh, to try to improve recovery of the patient. So it mainly uh, consists of uh, Pre-operatively having the proper uh, assessment, the proper nutritional status, the proper fluid status, the proper cancelling, the proper DVT, uh, prophylaxis, etc., and antibiotics coverage. Post-op uh, to get the patient off the wires as soon as possible, remove catheters, remove central lines whenever we can, have a proper uh, wound, uh, wound care, have a proper pain control, and then obviously during the operation, uh, minimal operation, uh, operating time, a normal thermia, proper hemodynamics. So. Uh, this is a set of guidelines that has been established to decrease uh, the length of stay, decrease the rate of complication, decrease the rate of readmission and hospital cost. Um, I hope I went over all the basics. There's a lot to discuss in this topic, but mainly as I uh, started my, my talk, get to know your patient, all the details. You guys will have a long trip. It's not only about the procedure, and there's no one size that's, that fits all. There's no one checklist that you can apply on everyone and on every procedure. So take the time, take the proper decisions, 
correct your patient properly and follow them properly. This is really the, the essence of um, surgery. Uh, I'll leave the floor to questions. Okay, Dr. Andraus, I will be reading for you the question, if that's okay with you, so you can answer. Okay, so first question is, uh, are endoscopic and endovascular procedures included in the surgical field, or is it more towards medicine? Uh, this uh, definitely needs to go under surgery. Uh, it is an intervention. Uh, and the patient needs to be assessed as a surgical candidate, uh, mainly due to the possible complications. Uh, as I mentioned, endoscopy might lead to this uh, perforation. Uh, and endovascular with uh, uh, a prick can, can go wrong and can lead to a vessel injury, and then you will end up in a uh, serious surgical complication. Awesome, thank you. So the next question is, when do we really need PFTs as part of preoperative pulmonary evaluation? So whenever the patient has a baseline a pulmonary problem, uh, like um, COPD uh, or emphysematous uh, diseases or obstructive diseases uh, that are severe or the patient is severely pulmonary symptomatic, then we need proper PFTs to assess. And the most important thing is before a lung surgery. So before any thoracic lung resection, we need to make sure that the patient will have enough lung volume after resection uh, uh, before we opt to, to the operation. So this is when also PFTs are uh, most necessary. Is the serum electrolyte status affected by the nutritional status of the patient? Definitely. So I mentioned during my talk that we get our electrolytes from what we eat. Uh, so if the patient is not eating well or is uh, eating certain amounts of food that do not have all the requirements, then he might have a disturbance. And that's why it's important to understand what's the person uh, nutritional status before and after the surgery and to assess their electrolytes before and after the surgery and follow that up uh, in order to uh, provide them with the proper requirements. Another question, do we need to continue chemical DVT prophylaxis of high-risk patients after major surgery, after discharging them home? So, um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, things that go into account. Uh, what's the risk factor of the patient, the risk factor of the procedure, the thromboembolic risk versus the bleeding risk? Uh, the most important thing or the most obvious thing and easiest decision is if the patient has cancer. So the recommendation are to uh, proceed with uh, anticoagulation uh, prophylactically at least for 28 days post-op. However, if the patient, for example, has a DVT or has uh, uh, AFib or a mitral valve, then we need to resume their anticoagulation as soon as possible for life. And if the patient is at low risk with no cancer, with only maybe we, give, we gave them prophylactic anticoagulation in the um, hospital because he wasn't mobilizing well, and then we assess according to the mobility status of the patient and the risks, uh, whether we need to proceed with it or not. Again, keeping in mind the bleeding risk of the patient. So maybe uh, a patient with DVT, uh, we... Uh, uh, stopped their, uh, we bridged their anticoagulation during the operation, and then uh, the operation went well, but he had, uh, for example, an intracranial bleed. And then now it's contraindicated for me to, to uh, anticoagulate my patient. So I think of other options like IVC filter, for example. So these are all things that come into account. Uh, I'm just throwing ideas here, but it's definitely case by case uh, decision. Okay, and what do you recommend for patients coming in with anemia preoperatively? So, um, we mentioned that anemia is very important because hemoglobin is the oxygen carrying capacity. So, if the patient is coming anemic, first of all, I need to know why, because uh, if it's due to the pathology that I'm operating on, that's okay. We have an answer and we know how to deal with it. But maybe the patient is coming, for example, for a lipoma resection, and suddenly I find the patient anemic and he's not diagnosed with anything that will cause this. So I need to know maybe he has an undiagnosed uh, colon cancer, and maybe he has an undiagnosed hematologic pathology. So, first of all, we need to know why the patient is anemic. Second, uh, we have a cutoff for hemoglobin. So, any cardiac patient, uh, we don't like the hemoglobin below 8. Any regular patient, we don't like the hemoglobin below 7. Uh, otherwise, if the patient is symptomatic, uh, 
uh, we need to definitely transfuse. And sometimes post-op when the hemoglobin is on the low side, but not enough reason to transfuse, we think about iron supplementation, IV iron supplementation. So these are also things to keep in mind. Okay, and last question comes in as a follow-up to the previous one. Uh, so he says, I didn't understand the relation between GI secretions and the types of surgery like colostomy, ileostomy, etc. Okay, uh, I'll go back to the slide. Uh, salivary, for example. If your patient comes in uh, with uh, an esophageal rupture emergently and you need to go to uh, have your patient in esophagostomy, which is you get the esophagus to drain to the outside, and your patient is losing a lot of saliva, okay? Then you need to know the composition of your saliva to keep in mind what your patient might be losing uh, to understand the deficit to be able to replace it. Stomach, for example, if uh, your patient has a gastric outlet obstruction and is vomiting, you need to know what electrolytes is he or she losing in order for you to keep in mind what's the deficit and replace it. Uh, same things for uh, an ileostomy or a colostomy. So it's important to understand if the patient has an ileostomy, he will have a high output. He will be losing a three liter volume, which you need to keep in mind to replace. So you give the patient their maintenance and then you need to replace the three liters that he is losing from the ileostomy. And you need to replace the sodium chloride that he's, uh, or keep in mind the sodium chloride that he's losing. Uh, this is the importance and the, the effect and repercussions of what the patient is losing. It might not be only GI tract. Uh, it might be, for example, blood. If the patient is losing blood, just to make sure that you replace the blood he is losing. So your patient losses are important to know what you need to replace. So your patient will not go into deficit and then it will be maybe hypovolemic, you will have a low potassium and cardiac arrhythmia. So this is for you to be proactive and to provide your patient with the proper support. Thank you. Uh, Khaled, you may ask your question. Uh, thank you, Diane. Thank you, AWS. And thank you, Rebecca. Fantastic talk. I thank enjoyed you, yourself for you bringing uh, the beautiful slides and, uh, and the visuals. If I, may, if I may use this opportunity to highlight two points. Uh, sur surgical safety nowadays is a public health concern. Uh, every year, 7 million people are disabled because of surgery, and 1 million people die every year in the world because of surgery. You would think maybe it's because a difficult surgery, a, a challenging situation, maybe there was not enough equipment, but really the number one cause is poor preoperative management. So whether you end up in surgery or not, uh, doing meticulous preoperative management for every single patient, every single time is very important. Uh, the other thing uh, I would like to um, mention to you, a new score, cardiovascular risk assessment score, that was developed by a team from AUB, uh, Dr. Da'i and Dr. Spati. Uh, it's called the AUB HAS2 score. It was published in the Journal of the American Heart Association in March 2020. It's a nice and easy tool. And pardon me for being biased to my university. <laughs> we should be. I'm just trying to find it. Uh, is that it? Yes, that's the one. Okay. Interesting. So I, I, I'm not sure if it's projecting well. Uh, so this is the cardiovascular risk index and the revised cardiac risk index. It's good to know that even in our situation and with the limited resources we have, we can still contribute to the worldwide uh, concern of uh, patient safety, protecting our patients, and delivering the best care we have uh, or we can deliver. Thank you, Khaled, for the valuable intervention. That's uh, really good to know. I didn't even know about the score, so I can read about it now. Uh, and I encourage everyone to do so.
And uh, I really stress again on your point of surgical safety and the importance of, uh, of really prepping your patient properly uh, and on the, on the importance of our contribution. So I, I, I really agree with you. We have a lot to offer and um, we should uh, be working on, uh, on such uh, important uh, uh, contributions to the literature like this one. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled, for your intervention as well. For those of you who don't know, guys, Khaled is the chief resident of neurosurgery at AUB. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andraos, for this very informative lecture. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as I did. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Andraos. It was amazing. My pleasure. My pleasure. I hope you benefited. I hope it covered at least the basics of perioperative management. And uh, looking forward to the rest of the series lectures. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And we'll see you on Monday for the next lecture.